Thank you, Your Honor. For the first time in these series of trials, my job as the prosecutor actually seems like the easy one tonight. I could really rest my case now and not make an argument at all, and what you should do would be just as obvious to you all. Unless, of course, you're just plain stubborn and will stand in the way of justice being done, you know as well as I do that Barabbas is guilty. He's been convicted of multiple crimes already. We read in the court documents that the defendant's crimes were so heinous and public that he was infamous, a renowned murderer who led an insurrection. He's exactly the kind of guy that makes you have your children come in at night to protect them from danger. He's the reason you lock the doors at night. Most notable of all, he's already in jail. So this clemency hearing, this pardoning, it's really a sham. It truly is. What we have on one side is a teacher who some confess to be the Messiah, the King of the Jews. It's a lofty claim, I know, but we've seen the miracles that he's done. We've seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. At the least, he's a man who acts with the power of God and teaches with the authority of one sent by God. On the other hand, we have a convicted murderer, a man so wicked that this hearing shouldn't even be taking place at all. A life sentence is hardly long enough for Barabbas. Even Pilate knows it to be true. He's come out publicly and said, there's no fault in Jesus. He knows no crime has been committed by Jesus. You've done very well in our time together, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. You've adjudicated, you've judged these cases fairly. You've been a vital part of our legal system. And there's no reason why today should be any different. You simply must free Jesus of Nazareth. As a jury, as honorable, honest people, your integrity depends on this decision tonight. We've been asking the question for five weeks now, dearest Jesus, what law have you broken? The Jewish leaders, Pilate, even those who just plain don't like Jesus, have not brought one accusation that has any merit against Jesus. The burden of proof, the responsibility to prove their claims, it's not on me, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's on the defense. Because as far as any reasonable person can tell, Jesus is innocent. He should be freed. And Barabbas is dead to rights guilty and should remain incarcerated. As my counterpart comes up and tries to make his case, I ask you to listen critically. Listen carefully to the reasoning behind his argument because he's attempting to have you do the unthinkable, to free a murderer and to convict an innocent man. I see no way that you can possibly go through with that decision. Then again, it's not my job to make that decision. That's yours. Don't let your impartiality be swayed. Let the truth prevail. Barabbas is guilty, and you must keep him behind bars. If not for yourself, do it for your children and for your children's children. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further.
Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as we conclude our final trial here today, you're faced with the toughest case yet. Each trial that you've adjudicated to this point has been preparation for this one. But there's a problem. And it's a problem that we can't get out from underneath. Each week, you've come to realize that you have something in common with the person that's on trial. And today is no different. The man on trial today, Barabbas, is a murderer, an insurrectionist, a thief, and the leader of an outright rebellion. Your job here today, though, isn't to decide his guilt or innocence. Today is a clemency hearing. You must make the choice either to pardon Barabbas or to free Jesus. There can only be one set free, and it's a question you must answer. The choice is yours, but it's one that you must make. This is the moment that each of the trials that have come before have been leading up to. Your decision today will dictate what happens in the coming week. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, hey, now I get that sometimes I'm like Peter and deny my faith. Or maybe you're thinking, sure, I've fallen asleep on the job in my face once or twice in my life, but don't tell me I'm like a convict. I'm not like that guy. I'm not that bad. I haven't murdered anyone, much less stolen or led a rebellion. While there was always a way out of each of the previous cases, as my counterpart tried to convict faithful people, otherwise faithful people, who were just simply caught up in their mistakes. Tonight, there's no yarn to spin, there's no tale to tell, and there's no way out of making a tough choice. Now, let me tell you why. From the very beginning of humanity, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, with that one misguided decision to listen to the lies of the tempter and eat the forbidden fruit, everything changed. Since Adam, you've all been afflicted with the same internal, undeniable predisposition to choose yourself over others, to choose rebellion over reverence. From the very moment of your birth, you began falling away, and not just falling, but running from those things of God, unable to do anything by your own power or will to please God, you've all run headlong, not only into those things which God forbids, but those that demand eternal death as punishment. Here again, these words of Scripture, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you kept a record of sins, O oh Lord, who could stand? If you don't understand by now, if it's not clear by this point, you'd better stay sitting down because like Barabbas, you can't stand before the Lord in your sin. So not only are you equally as guilty, equally as deserving of death as Barabbas, now you must decide whether he'll be pardoned. So we're brought to the crux of the situation. Not only are you like Barabbas, but you're forced into the perspective of the other major players in the charges that were read. You're not only like Barabbas, you're like the crowd as well. Just like those Jewish leaders, people gathered before Pilate all those years ago, you've got an agenda. You want something. You'd like to set Jesus free. You know that this is all a sham fake blasphemy charges simply made up by those Jewish leaders who didn't like their power questioned by Jesus. You know what will happen if you don't release Jesus. They're asking for the death penalty, and not just that, but a horrific, brutal death, crucifixion. Surely an innocent man shouldn't have to suffer and endure that. But on the other hand, if Jesus really were to be gone, then there really wouldn't be anyone around to demand your reverence anymore. You could finally be your own God, making your own decisions, free of consequence and guilt, truly free. Or so you think. The reality of the situation is this. There is a God in heaven who created you and everything that you see. 
and his divine justice requires, demands that your sin be paid for. Something must be done about your sin. So you see, here's the truth. You might feel wrong. You might not like it, but you really don't have a choice. You've got to release Barabbas. You need Jesus on that cross. You can feel your sin weighing you down, dripping from every moment of your life. And there's only one way that that sin will be dealt with. If Jesus, who's totally innocent, takes your place on that cross. Barabbas isn't innocent. Far from it. Neither are you, but the choice is clear. You have to pardon him. He'll go free, and Jesus will go to his death. Your sin is the reason Jesus is here in the first place. And now you've got to cast a vote that will send Jesus to his death. But take comfort. Though you make the unthinkable decision to free a murderer, though you must remember these words. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus does all of this willingly for you. He stands before Pilate. He's nailed to the cross. He bleeds and he dies. Because God the Father can't stand to be without each of you for all eternity. Through this great sacrifice, your fortunes have been reversed. Though you are sinful in this great exchange, you put on the righteousness of Jesus, and you are restored to new life. So knowing all of this, we're left wondering that basic question, why? Why would God send Jesus to earth to be treated this way? Why would Jesus endure this? Listen again to those words that explain the Apostles' Creed. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and innocent suffering and death. Now listen close, friends. Here's your answer. Why? Why does Jesus do this? That you may be his own and live under him in everlasting righteousness innocence and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. So you see, you simply must pardon Barabbas, and in doing so, you declare Jesus guilty. He must go to the cross in your place, so that he might be the firstborn from the dead, and win you the salvation he so greatly desires for you. It's going to be gruesome. An innocent man will die. But three days later, your Savior will rise. And the plan that God enacted with that promise to Adam and Eve in the garden all those years ago will be complete. Through his death, you will be given life. And you are declared not guilty. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further.